Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief episode, I would like to talk about a term called the burden of representation. Now, this concept, and I've used it in my published work as well, uh, was very interestingly discussed by Kobina Mercer in his book, Welcome to the Jungle. And I think it is still pertinent to post-colonial studies, but also minority studies or studies mm -hmm. that deal with any literature or art that does not belong to the dominant group within a given culture. So while talking about the Black Arts Exhibition in London, uh, or the films, the African diaspora films that were emerging in the 80s and were being uh, shown and produced. What he thinks is that because it was so rare to have the minority voices represented on the large screen, and I'm going to quote here, because access and opportunities are regulated such that films tend to be made only one at a time. There is an inordinate pressure on each individual film to be representative or to say as such as possible in one single filmic statement. And this is what he considers the burden of representation, right? That is expected of minority arts or minority literature. And what could be other example of it? Now think about it, if you ever read a novel about Pakistan or India, right? So the metropolitan audiences probably might read it, okay, as an exotic text or maybe as a realistic text. But if you go and ask the Pakistanis or the Indians, most of the times the readers would say, but it never talked about this, it never talked about that, right? Because in their mind, they are expecting the work to carry the burden of their entire culture. And part of the reason is, is the anxiety that so few of those stories are told and shared in film, but also in print, that the fear is that if the novel or a film doesn't carry the entire burden of you know, an entire culture, it will somehow misrepresent that culture. And so that is what, in my understanding, what Kobina Mercer means when he's talking about this burden of representation and its strong association with the minority politics and politics of representation. Now, we can also extend this further, this term, and see how the native responses to the diasporic authors emerge, right? A lot of time the critiques of diasporic Indian or Pakistani authors are also um, kind of underwritten by this expectation of a total representation, right? So these authors, and I myself am guilty of that. B but, so what is expected of these authors who are writing publishing and representing, so to speak, the places and cultures of the periphery to metropolitan audiences, we expect them to be more nuanced. We expect them to be the proponents of their pri primary culture and to try to represent something that is redeemable, uh, that is complex and doesn't just rely on the stereotypes, right? So all of that in one way or the other is what could be considered under the general rubric of burden of representation. And that's why I think as a concept, the burden of representation is really, really crucial. And, and important to understand. Now, another way that I use the term in my pedagogy and in my teaching is that when I teach a novel about Africa, you know, if furu or things fall apart, I try to explain this term to my students as to what does burden of expectation means. And what all I also tell them that, you know, they should keep in mind 
about the burden of representation, but also keep in mind that no text can carry the burden of an entire culture or is expected to carry the burden of entire culture. Now, an interesting thing to note is that the metropolitan novels or dominant cultures or people from dominant groups do not expect that of their artists. So if you read Philip Roth and he sets a novel in New York, you never turn around and say, but, but what about the South, right? Because there is no expectation of such total representation or there is no expectation or anxiety in the dominant group and their readers, right, to expect a novel or a movie to carry the burden of representation. But certain subtle forms of critiques are there, right? So if you are now making a film or a TV show which is about young women, there will always be queries about the burden of representation because certain segment of society, certain women, certain class, certain gendered human beings will be excluded or not represented. So that is when then people are already asking a TV show or a play to justify its own lack of carrying the burden of representation. So I think overall it's a really instructive term. <clears throat> it can inform your writing. It can inform your understanding of the text. If you're reading a novel and you know about that culture and there is something missing and you point it out, then you can ask yourself, is it because I'm expecting this novel to carry the burden of the entire Igbo culture or entire Nigerian society? Or is it because that is an extreme lack in the novel and a huge slippage, right? And that without that, the representation becomes faulty, right? But knowing and being aware of the concept of burden of representation in either way will inform your writing and I think will make it more informed and nuanced. And I already talked about teaching because in teaching then you can be instructive and you can also guide your students to be wary of expecting a novel to carry the burden of representation. I first used it in one of the first uh, uh, essays that I published about uh, we, uh, about Naipaul's The Bend in the River, and that's when I encountered Kobina Mercer and used his work, and I found it really useful. Beyond just using the term, of course, I highly recommend the book. Uh, it's, it's a book which is rich in visual art and pictures, and it's one of the best film studies of uh, diasporic African uh, British films and how they are received, how they are produced, and what is at stake in the process of production and reception. So that's all. I hope this is useful to you. This is yet another term that I thought I should share my understanding of it. And you already know that you know my understanding of it is limited by my own intellect, so I can't claim to have an exhaustive knowledge of the term. But I hope you can use it in your teaching, in your writing, and in your reading yourself. That's all. Thank you so much for your time, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.